Good morning. Welcome to Symposium 2006. On behalf of the Symposium Organizing Committee, I'd like to welcome all students, administrators, teachers, speakers, professionals, and guests to Boston University's seventh annual symposium. Through a day-long series of panels and keynote discussions, Symposium 2006 will explore the theme, Creating Value Through Innovation. Leaders in fields ranging from finance, technology, public and nonprofit, healthcare, marketing and entrepreneurship will offer their insights into how they've used innovative, value-adding techniques to keep their product services, products and services relevant to today's marketplace. I'd like to take this opportunity to truly introduce an innovative man, the Dean of the Boston University School of Management, Dean Latif. Thank you, Michael. That was very nice, but a little brief, I thought. <laughs> I was ready for another five minutes worth. <clears throat> Michael, seriously, you and your student colleagues have done an absolutely superb job with this year's symposium, and I thank you on behalf of the school and offer you our hearty congratulations. To Michael's welcome, I want to add mine to all of you. It's wonderful to see so many students and many alumni here this morning. We're delighted you've chosen to participate. This morning's special guest is Mr. Jack Welch, formerly CEO of General Electric, and arguably the best known corporate leader alive. John Francis Welch, Jr. is a Massachusetts boy, having been raised, <laughs> having been raised in, the North Shore of in the North Shore in Salem. In 1957, he graduated from the University of Massachusetts with a degree in chemical engineering. He went on to earn a master's and a PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Illinois. Incidentally, now that Dr. Bob Brown has become president of Boston University, we've all gained a new appreciation for PhDs in chemical engineering <laughs> and their management genius. <laughs> in 1960, Jack Welch got his first job with GE in Pittsfield. He became a GE lifer, spending the next 40 years of that firm, 20 of them as his chief executive officer. The story of his success is now legendary. He revolutionized that lumbering giant of an organization into a high growth dynamic company that became a model for others to follow. On his watch as CEO, the market value of GE increased from 12 billion to $280 billion. That's a 23 fold increase. His book, Straight from the Gut and Winning, which he wrote with his lovely wife, Susie, and Susie is here, would you stand please? We welcome you, Susie, and we thank you for making something of this fellow. <laughs> These books are wonderfully readable bestsellers. Warren Buffett is quoted on the front of Jack's book, Winning, and he says, no other management book will ever be needed. <laughs> Bad news for Barnes & Noble down the street here. <laughs> While making history as a corporate titan, and that's a 24-7 job, Jack managed to keep a low single-digit handicap on the links, and some of us who struggle with golf can only marvel in disbelief. Jack Welch is the living embodiment of business innovation, innovation in technology, innovation in products, and innovation in processes. How appropriate it is that he's here today addressing an MBA, an MBA symposium whose theme is creating value through innovation. On that subject, Jack did write the book. Speaking of books, Many of you have met Jack here a few months ago when he was signing copies of the latest book, Winning. We are honored indeed that he would agree to be with us today. He's, he's in an incredible demand as a speaker, at very high prices, by the way. So we gratefully welcome him back to Boston University. <laughs> and on a Saturday morning and with no fee, that's really generous. <laughs> Although Jack did not study here, he's managed marvelously to overcome that deficiency. <laughs> so I ask you to please join me in welcoming this generation's most extraordinary business leader, Jack Welch. <laughs> now,
Now for the rules. As many of you, you know from seeing Jack's talks on television, he prefers to speak in a Q&A format where the audience is responsible for the questions and Jack provides the candid answers. As you formulate your own questions, please go to the microphones in the aisles. When you're called, I'd appreciate it if you tell us your name and your affiliation with Boston University. Welcome again, Jack. I'm going to kick off the questioning if I can. Most, fo most folks might associate the idea of innovation with something invented from whole cloth. But in winning, you make this observation when talking about best practices. And best practices typically are thought of as something somebody else invented. And Jack says this, find best practices, adapt them, and continually improve them. When you do that right, it's nothing short of innovation. New products and service ideas, new processes, and opportunities for growth start to pop out everywhere and actually become the norm. Talk to us about that. Well, I think people too often think of innovation as going to the lab, or going off in a garage, and designing something new and bringing it to market. I think innovation's all around you. You see or smell something that somebody else is doing. You adapt it to your place and take it to new, new levels. That's a breakthrough for your company. And the process never stops. And, and if you've got a company that has a mentality inside that is filled with searching for a better idea every day, not just as a slogan, but as a real concept, you will have innovation around you all the time. Classic example, we had an innovation by going to India. We went to in, in India in the late 80s. And uh, we went there to sell lots of products to a billion people. Well, 15 years later, later, we still haven't reached a billion dollars in sales. But we've got 41,000 employees because we found intellect. And we were the first people to go there and build huge R&D centers, technology centers, by using the intellect. That was it. That's innovation. Getting stuck in one corner when, when bureaucracy won't let you sell products, but finding a, another answer, intellect, and capitalizing on it. So I think innovation is everywhere. I think it's in, in the structure of your organization. I think it's in every process you deal with. It's just finding a bit better way to do things every day. Jack, most CEOs would speak very glowingly about the value of innovation. But if push comes to shove, between cost cutting and spending on R&D, cost cutting too often wins. Has that been your observation? Well, it's the easiest thing. Uh, it's, it's often the easiest way out. But, you know, that's the job. The only job of a leader is you, when you ran Ford Europe or anyone in this room running businesses, the only reason for having the job is to make the right trade-offs between cutting costs, productivity, efficiency, and developing new ideas and new products. Anybody in the world, for example, I, I love these CEOs that say, oh, I'd like to have it. I hate these analyst pre presentations, uh, analysts are pressing me for, for, for quarterly earnings, et cetera, et cetera. Look, any jerk in the world can squeeze all day and say, talk to me in five years about my growth. Or anybody in the world can say, I'm dreaming. Please, I, I'm not going to make any numbers for a while. You can squeeze or you can dream. But a manager does both. A leader does both. You dream and you squeeze. You eat while you dream. And there's no, and it's no getting around. That's why you're paid. Any jerk can do one or the other. <laughs> but it's your job to make those trade-offs. Makes sense. How about groups innovating versus individuals? I think that's probably more sophisticated than my pay grade. I think uh, <laughs> this is an... I'm more practical than this university atmosphere of groups versus individuals. I would say, look, you want innovation everywhere you turn. You want it in the, the blood. You want to be excited about it. You want to re but, but you want to reward people. See, I w w was with a company, as Lou said, for 40 years. And the first uh, 20, 20 years we were there, all we did was, uh, all I ever saw was uh, the rewarding uh, of inventors, plaques. We gave them more plaques per square foot than anybody in the world. <laughs> Everybody that had an idea got a plaque. But, but what, 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 I'm talk, uh, what I'm talking about is, is a concept where people are looking around every minute for an idea. 
And when they get one, it doesn't matter who, who had it. They take it to another level. So you, you reward the person who takes an idea, expands it, and the inventor that doesn't become the hero, but the user, the user of the concept, who develops it, who doesn't have an NIH attitude, not invented here, who's excited, you're excited by what he's doing, and you grab it, and, and, and you share the credit with them, you talk about what, what you learned there, and you, uh, you have an attitude that's open to that. That's a big deal, because most companies will operate like this. If it's not my idea, and don't take my idea. They're hiding it in here. You want people that grab ideas, that share them, that grow with them. That's what you want. You want a culture that just thirsts for them and doesn't care where they come from. The stripes on the shoulder don't determine the quality of the idea. The idea does. And the people who grab them are the heroes. The people who take ideas from innovators, if you will, from, from the, and, and take them to new, new levels are the people you want to have around you. You should be passionate. <laughs> <laughs> if you give out that many plaques, you could be a dean. <laughs> <laughs> I don't give out plaques. I, 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 I always said cash beats the hell out of plaques. <laughs> In that case, you can be president. <laughs> I want to take some questions from the audience, so find your way to the microphone, please. While you do that, let me ask you, Jack. In an environment where you're stimulating innovation and so forth, there's going to be failures. So if I'm working in your culture and I know you want us to innovate, yeah. some of the ideas are going to fail. How do I not get punished for failing? You've got you to make examples. You gotta, if you're leading a group and you've got somebody t t taking a swing, you've got to make examples out of them and make them heroes for taking the swing. I remember we tried to invent a, uh, an energy efficient light bulb in, in the early 80s. It was, it's now for sale everywhere, but in th those days it cost 10 bucks to make. And the, environment, and the environmental and it lasted 5,000 hours and it used le less energy. Well, everybody in the environment loved it, except they didn't want to pay for it. So the product was before its time. And we were out there with a 1099 light bulb. And all of a sudden, all, all, all those green folks turned red. <laughs> and, and they wanted no part of that product. As eventually, ten, 10 years later, it came. But we made here, we gave te, uh, te television sets to everybody on the, on, the, on the project, 120, 160 people. Uh, we sent them away for a weekend at Disney World, and we put it in the newspapers everywhere that they took a swing and they failed. So you should wait. Whenever you see examples where people are taking swings, you know, somebody asked us in this column we're writing now, Susan and I are, are writing a column weekly for Around the World, we write for Business Week also. One of the um, things we, that we always uh, we get questions on is, when should a boss take responsibility for failure of an employee? And the answer is every day, every single day. Unless the employee violates a policy, steals something, or does something else, you're in it with them. And so every time you hear people out there trying things, damn it, you were there. And you can't walk away from it. So you've got you've to make it here. To get a culture of risk taking, you need to reward risk taking. You get the behavior you reward. And that is probably the most important thing you'll hear today. Everything you measure and reward, you'll get that behavior. If you ignore it, you won't get it. If you want risk taking, reward it. Thank you. Please. Good morning, Dr. Welch. Uh, my name is Ashan Walpita. I'm a freshman here at the School of Management. Um, I'd like to ask you, there's a lot of emphasis on reaching out to the next one billion customers, namely from the developing world, India, China, Brazil, etc. How important do you think technology innovation and innovation of new processes uh, is going to affect the business world? You mean reaching out to new consumers, you mean? Yes. Well, if you don't, if you don't have something new, stay out of China. I mean, if you're bringing me to there, you're dead. The only thing you, you, you can sell in China today with their competitive genes that are there and the dynamics there is something they don't have. It's, so, it's something that changes the game. A new MRI machine or a new CAT scanner or 
uh, a new plastic or a new something new, but it's not. You're not going to get anywhere with a commodity. They'll beat the hell out of you. So, in, as far as innovation is concerned, if you're looking at the next world, if you will, you've got to have innovation coming out your ears because the whole world's converging on these places with the best ideas in the world. Thank you, Jack. Are you optimistic about China's continuing growth? Yes, I am. I, um, but I'm not frightened by it. I think it's good. I think that, um, you know, um, China is, in my view, in this experiment of capitalism and, uh, if you will, communism or semi-communism or whatever you want to call it, is not going to be linear. There's no way you can take a billion and a quarter people and go linearly at 10% a year or 12% a year or 9% a year. But one of the things people don't, if I may just digress for a second. Sure. One of the things people that are panicking and throwing up their arms on everything else about the U.S., take a look at the, just take last year, 2005. China's economy is $1.7 trillion. It grew 9%. Everyone says it's growing 9%, 10%. Let's give them 10%. That's $170 billion of new GDP to feed 1.4 billion people. U.S., oh, it's awful, it only grew 4%, it's terrible, it's unbelievably bad. 4% times a $13 trillion economy is $520 billion to feed 300 million people. So you got three times the GDP delta to feed one-fourth the number of people. So don't panic. Keep innovating, keep driving it, and we'll, we'll have a wonderful game of opportunity, and they'll develop and grow and be part of the world economy. And as I, as I believe to my toes, the more dependent we are on each other, the more peaceful we will be. Thank you. Um, regarding the topic that we were Would you introduce yourself, please? Uh, Dan Lenhart, second year MSMBA. Good morning. Um, regarding the topic we were speaking about a moment as far as research and development or innovation, when you can't quantify things like the ROI or where it's going to take the business. Any suggestions for how to sell it up the ladder when it's these new ideas that we either ourselves have come up with and we want to see them brought to fruition, but we can't necessarily quantify, or nor could anyone, well, quantify the benefits long term? For, for, first of all, you're never going to sell anything based on ROI. You can make your ROI anything you want. You can make DCRR anything you want by just putting a big n number in the back end. All you know how to make that calculation. A big, a big residual value, and you can, and you can do anything. So you, what, the way you sell it upstairs is a passionate view of the idea, a concept of why it's a wow, why it fits, why the market you're after. Make the case for your, if, what we, we call it in the book, aha, your aha. And then make the case with everything in your body. And believe in it, and go after it, and put yourself on the line. Forget the damn numbers. Thank you. Uh, you. You do more deals in business based on the stuff in the person presenting the idea than you do with anything based on the sheet. Just know that in your blood. Thanks. Please. I'm, hi, Dean. Jack. Uh, my name's Sam onyeme Lukwe, and I'm a second year MSMBA as well. Um, I'd, my question really centers around the same type of issue uh, in terms of a manager being able to understand the environment. Because from a top, uh, from the upstairs, you know, upstairs offices, you're looking down, you can't really understand what's happening in the culture. Because oftentimes I've walked into a very successful company and seen employees that are lackluster, that are complaining. How do you, what, or what thoughts do you have to recommend ways to be more, um, conversant with the type of culture that you have at a company, and even though th there may be success, the, uh, being able to t tap into the real you know, potential there and, and go beyond that success. Well, every day you're in the office, you're not doing anything. You're not making anything, you're not selling anything, you're not doing anything. So you're running a company, you better get, get your butt out into the field. And the best way I kept in touch with things was, uh, constantly uh, going to our classes uh, at Crotonville, where I, educational school. I, I, I would go once a month and spend six hours there, and then a couple hours at the bar afterwards. Mm -hmm. I'd learn as much in the bar afterwards as I did in the six hours of, 
of the, of the court courses, but I, I never missed a class in 21 years. And I went there, and I, I had it on the schedule all the time, and I just got the pulse of the place. We also did something else, which we did 25,000 person blind uh, uh, attitude surveys uh, every six months. And, uh, you don't run your company, but, but we didn't ask, do you like the food in the cafeteria? Uh, do you like your parking lot? We didn't ask any of that nonsense. We asked, is what you're hearing, and what we're saying, what you're feeling? Things like that. And, and the disconnects in some businesses were wide. Right. And then you'd go to that business and you'd talk to them and you'd work on it. But look, it's never going to be per perfect. Uh, if, if you, we, we've gotten a couple thousand e emails in our, in, in, our, in our column so far. And I'd say 90% of them are. I'm a genius and my boss is an ass. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have never been to a place, when I went to Cro uh, Crotonville and there'd be 160 in the class, mm -hmm. I'd say, why do we have the only 160 smart people here in the company? <laughs> because everything was wrong with everything else. <coughs> they had it nailed. So I think you're always going to have that. That, that. That's how things work. Thank you. Great. And, and you can't stay up all night over it. Just try to make it better. Thanks, Sam. Hi, Grant, Grant Morrison, second year um, MBA student. Um, when, you're, when you spend your time at GE, how did you f identify, foster, and retain the innovative leaders that you needed to move your organization forward? Well, it's one thing that we can say, I, I, I can't take credit for anything else, but I, I can take credit with a team of people of living the fact that we knew what our core competency was. It wasn't designing a jet engine. It wasn't building a turbine, it wasn't building a CAT scan, or it wasn't designing the Seinfeld show. What it was, was building people. We believed it to our toes. We practiced it every day. Uh, we never had a review that wasn't a personnel review. We had a budget review. Well, the first two hours of the budget review were going over the human resource review we had six months prior to that. So all these things, it was a constant stream of, of uh, of talking about people, of grading people, on values and on performance. Performance got you in the game, and values got you promoted. That's how we dealt with it. We dealt, and values got your ass thrown out of there, too. Bad behavior got you out. And we didn't get everybody, but we found the biggest jerks we could find and got them out of there. And, that, and, and values count. They're real. I mean, it's unbelievable how people think values are squishy and soft. Well, they're not. If you, if you have a, a, a value that says boundaryless behavior, share ideas from everywhere, be open to gender and race, and then somebody isn't open to globalization, doesn't want to travel, doesn't promote uh, gender differences, doesn't do that, you've got to remove them. Or else you can't have that as a value. If you keep that, it, the worst thing a manager can do, this is the thing you've, you've heard, some of you may have heard me say before, there are four types of man managers, the one, one that has the values, the one that has the performance, onward and upward. The sec second one is the easiest one, uh, doesn't have the values and doesn't get the results, throw them out. The third one has the v uh, values and misses the numbers, Give them another chance. Try them somewhere else, because you don't always get people with the right value. But the fourth one is the one that kills companies. And I'll guarantee you've seen it all over, wherever you work. The person that, the person that delivers the numbers, but is a horse's ass. <laughs> but they keep saying, let's go one more year with them. They, they're delivering the bacon. That's what breaks a company apart. That's what kills everything in a company. And don't let you, if you are run, run, running places, don't let it happen to you. Don't do it. How many of you have seen it occur in your business careers? Now, isn't that shameful? Well, if you get in a position of power, don't let you be the same person that's trying to make your budget so you'll keep the jerk. That's the compromise that's made all the time, and it's a bad compromise. That's a longer answer to a short question, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's Morning, a good answer. Uh, ha happily, we have none of those jerks here, but it's, it's absolutely true. Good morning, Brett House, uh, second year MBA, International Management Program. Managers are frequently, um, especially in large organizations like GE, faced with 
a choice between a more profitable short-term decision and a less profitable decision with, that's more innovative and has better long-term benefits. Can you uh, describe the dynamics involved in such a decision and uh, give some examples from your own experience? Yeah, hopefully it's the case of, uh, that's why I argue, although it's not in favor r right now, it was in favor, I was lucky when I was there, it was in favor of multi, a multi-business company, or, or that awful word conglomerate, where you can make those tra uh, trade-offs. For example, we had a turbine business, in the, uh, a power turbine business in the 1990s that was losing money in, in 1996. Well, we had to spend a billion and a half dollars. The, the proposal was, the guy had a proposal, spent a billion and a half dollars uh, to um, go after the next generation high heat temperature, uh, high, high firing temperature turbines that would change the efficiency game. So he came in, made the case why he thought he could do it, and we bet on it. That's a case where it was a billion and a half dollars over, over uh, three years of R&D that we could have put to the bottom line. We did it. Got lucky, the turbine was fantastic, and we made five, went from losing money to making five billion dollars after taxes six years later. Unbelievable. Because you now we had the market position, but we didn't have the right turbine. Then we got the turbine, the game was over. So you face that all the time, but again, it's back to that, uh, that discussion we, we, we had with the, uh, the, the ROI fella. It's how you sell it. You, you are going to be faced with those trade-offs every day. That's what your job is. And you're going to bet. The best story that I have for this whole thing of, of making uh, trade-offs and going with passion and belief, I was in, um, in Thailand in, I think it's 97. It was during the Asia. It was the Saturday. I was in Bangkok, the Saturday that the whole bottom f fell out in the a Asian crisis. And the, and the Thai bot dropped 60% in 24 hours. Now, I got out of there and came home, and I was home, and two weeks later, the guy I was visiting there, the Ranji's operation there, uh, is having a board meeting. We're having a G Capital board, board meeting on the following two weeks from then. And I see in this pitch a presentation where a guy wants to spend uh, $160 million to buy $2.5 billion of Thai auto paper. I'm going, I just came back from there. I just saw the whole place collapse. This is the craziest thing I've ever seen. The next morning, the guy pops in to make his pitch. He's all dressed up, all sharp. He's going to make a pitch. So I just saw it two weeks before when we were scared we were going to lose the whole world. And he's in for, a, he wants $160 million to make this deal. And he's coming across the table. He says, let, let me explain to you. The Thai people uh, will sleep in their car before they'll give, give up the loan. Uh, that, that there, there are no indigenous man manufacturers there. There are no producers. So the Japanese cars now, with the Thai bot down 60%, are going to be in a fortune to buy a new, new car. The cars, these lease payments will be forever paid. So he's pounding the table. We're all going, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> well, well we, we, we finally, because of his complete rational commitment as to why it would work, we said, here, here, here's the money. Go do it. And I can't tell you, gains of 8 to 12 times our money uh, based on that. You know, he had no ROI, no other game. He had the cultural thing that, and his passion and his belief that it was the right game and, and, a, and a very solid r rationale. Ties will sleep in their car before they'll give, give it up. And there'll, there'll, there'll be no imports of cars with a weak bot. So, and there's, and no, there was no calculation in the world that would make that. You know, we also turned some stuff down that we should have approved. So I'm not, I'm giving you the, the, the good story. I can probably give you three bad ones. But, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that's the job you're making all the time. You're making those calls, and that's what you're doing. You'll be making them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ali from uh, Economics Department at BU. Uh, Mr. Welch, I, I want to ask you, like, uh, would you agree that uh, innovation uh, thrives in a culture and environment of copyrights and uh, you know, legal protections? And if that is the case, then how would you see uh, innovation being challenged or transformed in an arena uh, where like, you have open source movements and you're, where you might have uh, developing countries' governments which are not keen on copyrights as, for example, US patents would have been? I think China, let's say China is a perfect example. 
they're, they're, there's a, they're, they're a, it's the Wild West. I mean, the patents are laughed at. Uh, counterfeiting is uh, a way of life. Uh, I've sold, for example, I, I, I've sold uh, 250,000 books of winning in China legally, and yet I've, <laughs> I've seen eight other uh, prints of the same book on funny paper that somebody made. I don't know how many books they actually sold. So, I mean, there's no, there's no, but China is filled with innovation. In, in, in innovation, it, it's a great story, you know, uh, that innovation must have patent protection and all that, you're going to do it. Innovation comes from somebody who wants to make a buck and is going to come up with a new idea and they're going to do it with patent protection, hopefully. But if it isn't there and they got the idea, they're going to go and they're going to hope their idea is there and somebody co copies it. By the time you copy it, they're, they're, they're betting they'll be here with a newer idea. So, look, you want to go to a place. The only time you don't like regulation, or the only, only time you like regulation, is when you go to a country that doesn't have any. <laughs> so without question, you'd like to have it. Sure. But it isn't slowing Ch China's innovation down at all. So I think you'll live with it, and you'll see, and, and, and hopefully the WTO over the next 50 years will come to some uh, harmonization of, of copyright and patent protection, but I wouldn't bet my life on it. I wouldn't bet my business plan on it. Good morning. My name is Deborah Lunt. I'm an entrepreneur in Massachusetts, and so I'm just a guest of the U professor. So my question isn't at all MBA technical. Um, when you mentioned the fears that we have of China and the situation that China has, um, do you think that our innovation is declining in this country? I see your passion here to be here and to speak about, you know, developing ideas and, and really running with them. Are we losing an edge in that respect? No, I don't think so at all. No? I think we've got, there is no country in the world where the confluence of energy and ideas and money come together so easily. I was talking to Dave out here in the audience who, who, who's walking around with his pockets filled with dough looking for bright ideas and young people to take them. And, that I, and, and that's what we have in this country. That's what makes this country different than every place else. It just makes it different. Uh, you go to uh, Japan and Europe, it's stifling in terms, in terms of venture capital work. Uh, uh, our venture capital world is just <coughs> miles ahead of everyone else. We were at, on, on this book tour. Su uh, uh, Susie and I went to 35 business schools uh, in the course of 60 days or so in the, in the spring. And we would say that in, in, in anecdotal evidence of people si signing books, that somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of the kids in every school, weren't talking about joining GE or Johnson & Johnson or IBM or DuPont. They were talking about starting their own business, trying it. And they had all kinds of ideas. And we were saying, if not now, when? Go for it. You're young, take a swing, and they were all fired up. And there's people out there with buckets of money wanting to support good ideas. That doesn't happen in Germany. It just doesn't happen. You sign up, you go to Siemens, you go to Mercedes, you go to somebody else, and, and then you die. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it is. So as long as we have this thirst and this, and, and we're open and, uh, and we allow, we were in Atlanta, uh, at, at, the Atlant at the Atlanta Business uh, Journal's uh, conference, and they had the top 50 companies in Atlanta, room pulsating with energy, 50 tables, uh, 10 at a table, of 12 at a table of each company, plus some other people, and they started reading them off, number 50, number 49, number 48, and these companies were all companies, I never heard of one name, the criteria was you had to be over $100 million in sales, in revenues, and you had to be growing at least 25% a year to qualify. Well, there's 50 I never heard of. The winning company, the winning the guy had grown from zero to $134 million in three uh, years, had gone from one employee to 740 employees, 
was a guy serving the airline industry, probably the crappiest industry in the world. <laughs> and here's this guy who's got a de-icing product. A de-icing, a brand new way to de-ice planes and change the game. Created 734 new jobs. That's what we have in this country. We have great people matched up with buckets of liquidity making great things happen. Yes, uh, good morning, Dean Latif, Mr. Welsh. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Jim Puya. I'm a member of the uh, GSM class of 84. Uh, with particular regard to technology, um, given the ever-increasing pace of advances in technology, how do you overcome the fear, in particular with management or investors, uh, that an innovative idea might be obsolete before it ever gets off the ground, or at least before it generates enough of a return to make it worth investing in? You don't. That's the risk of the game. That's why you've got to be constantly looking for innovation at every corner every day. I mean, you've got to bet that somebody, you know one thing, that your idea, somebody else is onto it. You gotta believe that, you gotta know it, and so you've gotta get people that are faster, you've gotta be sure they got the tools that they need to do it, and it's a race. And you gotta see everything as a race, and nothing different. Because you gotta believe that somebody's gonna have your idea. And the idea that you'll have something and be protected with a wall, doesn't exist anymore. Hasn't existed for a long time, but now it's even more intense. So you've got to just get at that thing with an intensity and passion and excitement and speed. Speed is a value in a company, for example. Speed is a real value if you put it in a company. And you've got some review process that's review and review and review and bureaucracy, you'll be copied. But there's no, there's no solution around your question other than go like hell. Yeah. Thank you. Jack, it's been said that uh, big companies are conservative because they've got enough to conserve, where little companies are more risk-oriented because they haven't got anything to conserve yet. How do you keep a big GE monster as agile and innovative when you can be betting the store? Look, the whole philosophy is wrong. If you, look, if you go back, no offense to, to your prior history, uh, uh, <laughs> or other automotive institutions, or, or IBM, or GE in the 70s. Look, one of the things big companies did was, because they came out of the military industrial complex of World War II and built, built hierarchies, their job was to manage their size. The first speech I gave in GE was, we want to use our size, not manage it. Managing it is what these companies did. They sat on it, they organized, they, they reorganized, they moved people, up, but they didn't use their size to go to bat. I, oh, I make the argument that's the opposite of yours. If I'm an entrepreneur with one idea or one garage and not many resources, if I'm wrong, I'm out of business. My family doesn't eat, my house goes, everything goes to hell. If I'm in a big company, I can, I can screw up 40% of the time, as long as I don't end up in the right-hand column of the Wall Street Journal with the stories. But as far as the money's concerned, nobody's going to see it. You can go to bat all the time. So big companies have no excuse not going to bat, using their size, taking swings. I mean, you could not screw up GE. You couldn't do it. But you can screw up every small company very quickly with bad moves. And so big companies did, to your point, sit and manage their size in, in the 70s and the 80s. I think the LBO thing did wonders for companies in the 80s, shaking them up, entrenched managers, breaking up the, 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 those things. I used to give speeches about why KKR was a great thing for America. I almost got shot by my business peers. But it, was, it, it did, it shook up entrenched management. And so I, I, I'm a firm believer in the opposite being the luxury, if you use it. And you talk about it all the time. Why do you want to have $20 billion in positive cash flow and sit on it? And yet young people, uh, as often as not, would prefer to go with a startup because they've had the sense that the big companies are staid and stifling. 
Well, no, and, and I wouldn't disagree with going with a, with a, with a startup. Uh, uh, a startup, if you've got it in your blood that you want to take a swing, well, I, this is the time to take it. When, when your obligations aren't as great and all these things aren't as, as pressing on, on you, this, the, this, this is no time to be conservative. So I wouldn't argue that uh, a, a premise at all. But I think many big companies today give people great opportunities to take risks and get visibility early. Nothing like the small company with the excitement and the passion and the parties and all the stuff that goes with it. I have a question about healthcare and, and how. Uh, oh, geez. And, and how. <laughs> and, and specific. This and is definitely and above my pay grade. And specifically how you. Uh, handled it uh, with the physician side of taking care of GE employees. My name is Bert White. Uh, my doctorate's from the School of uh, uh, Theology here at, at BU, and, and in 92 I got an MBA here. And my question to you is, um, how did you run, and I mean squeeze and dream, measure and reward health care providers, and particularly doctors, how did you handle that as healthcare expense in every one of the GE products, as a, as a portion of every one of the GE products that hit the market. That's my first. And the second is, what's your dream? What's your innovative thinking about uh, how, we're gonna, how GE or anybody else, any other corporation, even a small guy, ought to solve that problem? <laughs> this is probably the hottest question in America today. Probably without question, the hottest question. All we did, to be perfectly on, on, honest with you, was when HMOs came, we used them to squeeze things. Very in, uninnovative uh, methodologies. My basic idea is we got a lot more involved when we got copays. As copays moved into the organization and people made choices, which is why I believe health savings accounts some direct, is the right direction long term to go, where people have choice, make decisions, and aren't g g given, if you will, a carte blanche is the best way, way, way to go. But I am by no means uh, going to g g give you the solution to this problem, which has eluded uh, thousands of practitioners and, and smarter people than me, and I've not found the answer. I do think choice and responsibility has done wonders for our, it was the best thing that ever happened to our cause. Do you know how much the, the health care cost is of a GE product? Like well, I, 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 I know what the total health care costs are. When they say Billion that. six, you, you divide by the non, non number of products, and, and, we'll, and we'll, get, we'll get a cost. When they say there's more uh, health care in, a, GE car, in a, a GM car than there is steel, what is that, how, how do you deal with that? We don't have that problem. We were not in the giveaway program in, this, in the 70s uh, that, that got to that. Hi, I'm Ed McDonough. I'm um, 2002 MSIS and MBA program. I currently work in healthcare, also at uh, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. And um, my question, really, when we're talking about innovation, it's about the overflow of information. And so, one of the the quotes that I've heard is something like, "Physicians to read all of the innovative ideas that are coming out in a year it would take them eight years to read that information." Um, and likewise, when I work day to day, when I look at my email box after 15 minutes and there's 150 emails in there, I see that it's pretty overwhelming, the amount of information and ideas that are flowing around an organization. How do we make sure that the right people are getting the right information and doing the right thing with it in organizations today with the overflow of information? Well, I think leadership is about simplifying. And I think leadership is about setting a vision, as I said before, get getting everybody on the same page getting into their skin with that vision, and then defining the values of all, quote, behaviors that are going to get there. And if that stuff that comes in is not part of that game, you don't, it doesn't get, get on the game. Look, one, one of the things that some companies, I'm involved consulting for a few companies, one of the kind of companies I was in, involved with came up with this brilliant I, I, idea. I thought to God it was going to kill the place. They, everybody was to get an email from everybody else on ideas. It was incredible. It was drowning the place, literally drowning the place. And I thought it'd be a good idea for me when I first went to work w w with the company to get on the list so I could get a feel for what was going on. Within a week, I called the CEO and says, take me off the list. I mean, I don't want to be part of So I think you've got to get, 
you've got to clarify what's important. What, what some leaders don't do is define what is important, where we're going, and, wh and how we're going to get there. And then everybody gets on the same page and goes after it. But if you were in this healthcare, for whatever reason, has never been the best managed industry in the world. And we know that. And, 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 I, and I don't have the answer to your overcrowded email box or anything else other than for you or your, or your, or your management to simplify what the company's doing and, and deal with that challenge. Do you, do you have an organization where you can go in and the question you just asked me, would that be a dialogue you, you could have with the company? Would you feel comfortable doing that? Yeah, I mean, it's a very open environment where everybody's sharing ideas, but it's constantly, so it's overwhelming because you've got too many. Uh, uh, so what happens when you bring it to the CEO's attention or the, or the top management's attention, and then we got to funnel this down? What happens? We start talking about tools, tools that can solution that. I think of knowledge management tools, things like that, to help people have dialogues within topics so that people can go, to, go somewhere and find a place where they can learn about a specific topic rather than uh, 5,000 emails coming through an email box. We look for ways to try to simplify. That's the, simplify that's the whole the job. That's the job of leadership, simplifying, yep. making the vision clear, and getting in everyone's skin so they buy in, getting buy in to go get it. I, I don't have much of an answer for that, though. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Um, first off, I want to thank you for being here because um, I have, my name is Bonnie McClellan and I'm a graduate from the MBA program in 2000 and I've recently been promoted to head up my own sales team. And uh, after having a short period where I panicked and tried to figure out who I could talk to and someone put your book in my hands and it's actually become my Bible for how to move forward. Um, thank you. So thank you. But uh, beyond that, um, I was wondering if what is it, or is there another piece of advice that maybe not isn't in that book, or is there a critical piece that's in there that you'd like to reinforce that you wish someone had told you when you had become a manager for the first time? No, look, without question, I think, and we wrote about this last week in Business Week and got an incredible response. It's in the book, though, also. Uh, it is the biggest transition of your life. You, you go from raising your hand like you did in school or like you did when you were an individual contributor in the company, getting great sales results, uh, to all of a sudden being the leader. And that day is where most people make their biggest mistake. It goes from being about you now to being about them, your team, and how good they are, how capable they are, and you've got to get, be satisfied that you will get your next promotion based on the reflected glory of their work. That means you focus on them. You encourage them, you challenge them, you move them up or out, if they're, depending on what they're doing. You change the bonus scheme, you re-look at it, you, you, you get a whole new energy to the place focused on them. And you have confidence in the organization that their results will, the biggest mistake we see is the person gets the new job and does the old job and wants to be the star particularly true in the automotive industry, where somebody's doing a, no, in, in, in engineering, I saw it, they'd, they'd be in bumpers. I actually saw that CEOs of Ford and GM in the early 80s having a debate in the parking lot in Williamsburg over the shape of the fender. Ford was coming out with a rounded fender like the Japanese cars, and GM still had the, the fin sort of tail. These two CEOs were almost coming to blows over the, that's not their job. Their, their job was to strategize the company and, and somebody else was designing the car. And so your job now is to make, find out where the new accounts are, how you can grow the business, where you can go, not call on your old friends or not dwell on your success, but on the success of your team. It's an incredible, it sounds simple, but most people that I met, I saw cl close up in GE were still raising their hand to be the star and forgetting the team that was now going to promote them up. So you got to focus on your team. How good are they? Where are they going? Who should stay and who shouldn't?
It's your turn. Hi, I'm Georgia Antonopoulos. I'm a second year MBA student. And I wanted to know, earlier you uh, talked about the importance of values within the workplace. And I just wanted to know a little bit about how your values have evolved over the years and why. Yeah, my, no, no, values is sort of a loaded word. I talk about behaviors in running a company. I, I, I use values slash behaviors. Uh, this discussion we just had, it took me 13 years and, and more than two management jobs to learn about it's about them and not about me. That was, the, that, that was huge learning for me. To build the greatest team in the world was your biggest achievement. That, 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 that was a value I didn't have. I, I, I was trying to stick my own nose above water to be seen, heard, and so all, all, all of my career until I, I realized that the way I was going to do it was having a great team and making them heroes. That, that's one value. Uh, I, I grew to uh, candor as a value that I believed uh, from the day I was old enough to breathe, I think my mother still that in me. Always say what's on your mind. Don't be scared. It got me in trouble a few times. Uh, I, I was constantly uh, called too outspoken in my performance appraisals. Uh, this guy can't go much further. He's just trouble. All those things. Because I, I, I said what, what I believed to be right. So candor has always been important. Differentiation is a big value of mine. I don't believe you can run a company without having an organization that di differentiates. Differentiates on how it treats different businesses, some with more not equal, and people not equal. Takes care of the stars, motivates the middle, and asks the bottom to move on. I believe that. Do you think the Patriots keep the worst players? Why should a sports team? Keep the worst place. The silliest thing that, that, that I hear when we talk about differentiation, and we, and we get this all the time, is how can you possibly uh, be telling somebody they're not that good and somebody else is that good? Well, why should you stop getting grades the day you leave BU? Why should a grown-up not be able to get grades, but a sixth grader is given best in the class and weakest in the class? It's the dumbest idea in the world. So you want to tell people where they stand. As a manager, people always have to know where they stand. You can't be turning away from it and then one, one, one day going in and saying, we're having a layoff. Now, when Ford has this big 30,000 lay, layoff, hopefully they got in a performance appraisal system that somebody won't be saying, why me? And somebody says, well, you weren't very good. And they pull out the appraisals that say they were great for the last 10 years. You want candor. You want differentiation, and those are values I believe in. I had a uh, then old professor at graduate school. I realize I'm about to tell you this. He's, he was then younger than I am now, but he was, re <laughs> was really old then. <laughs> and he said, the thing you're going to miss most when you leave here is grades. And everybody kind of snickered. And here, here now, 45 years later, is the same, same thing. <laughs> Please. Good morning. My name is Margaret Terrell, and I'm a second year MS MBA student. With the emerging role of information technology in business, can you speak to GE's strategy uh, for dealing with the challenges and opportunities of e-commerce and the internet? Uh, what types of innovations were born to remain competitive? Well, I can speak to them back a few years. I can't speak to them today. Uh, but without question, I, I felt that uh, the internet was the biggest boon that big companies, big old sluggish companies, had. It was more valuable to us to speed up processes internally. Forget as a sales tool, but, but, but it, it was great as a sales tool with salespeople, but I'm, I'm not talking about creating a new business with it. I'm talking about streamlining pro processes, taking paper out of the system. Uh, for example, ship and we, most count companies in, in, in the early 90s were ship and fix companies. Well, or, or, or you'd have a salesman who would, um, you'd sell a product, and the salesman would tell the guy, well, it left the dock two days ago. It should be here tomorrow, because everyone was lying, from the person in the plant to the person in the <laughs> sales force to the, all, all, the, all the way down the chain. What happens today is that something is tagged. They know where it is. You know exactly. You couldn't have built uh, uh, 
250 turbines uh, with um, 55 to 60,000 parts in each one from 13 countries without, informa without incredible information technology. You couldn't have done that in, in 1985, but you could do it in 2000. So the enormous streamlining in, in, and global effect of information technology has made big companies infinitely more competitive, infinitely more competitive. As far as starting up a new business, you know, you can, most, most e-business for most product lines has been cannibalization of the old way. It hasn't been, in, in, at least in GE's case, it's been cannibalization of the way you did it before, you're now doing it online. But the same stuff is being audited and, uh, and taken, at least that w w was that way through 2001. Thank you. What, uh, no one else should come to the microphones because we're going to have to wind down with those of you who are there. So let's uh, take the last few questions. My name is Josh Friedman. I'm an alumni of the school, class of 2002. When we were in school, we learned about the elevator speech, and uh, I guess you were partially responsible for that, where an employee traveling with you in an elevator would have 30 to 60 seconds to briefly describe uh, what they view their position as and how it provides value to the company. I'd be interested in hearing your elevator speech uh, <laughs> as CEO of uh, such a large company. <laughs> yeah, it's very, it's very, it, it, it's, it's very clear. We're going to be the most competitive in the enterprise in the world, be number one and number two in every business we are in, and we're going to do it with great people, focusing on great people every day. Thank you. It's a great elevator speech. Good morning. My question is about talent development. I'm a speaker here today. My name is Alana Schmidt Burns, and I work for Cone. And my role at Cone is vice president, and I lead teams of consultants. In your mind, is it possible to develop the ability for someone on a team to take risk, other than modeling that behavior, rewarding that behavior, and talking about your vision like you just did in the elevator speech? Yeah. No. I. I, I think the best way by, by far is modeling re, and rewarding and being visible about it. One of the things people don't do, for example, is have a value, let's take risk taking, have somebody do, do something, and then you might give them a private award. And some people say, well, I don't want to give it publicly. It, it'll cause dissension with the others. We'll say, why not me? Well, you've got to make everything you do public as much as you possibly can. Because that's how you define behaviors. If you keep it private, you, you won't ha have it work. So my advice to you is every time you want to drive something, some change in where you're going with that consultant team, you want to be able to make it very visible, the rewards and the discussion of it. And if you can't, it wasn't worth doing. But get out front. I, I, I see many managers frightened to single out behavior and notice because they don't want to deal with the majority that aren't getting it. They all say, well, I'm, I'm going to make two people ha happy, but I'm going to make 98 upset. I don't think so. I think if you've got the right attitude, you're going to get 98 people saying, hey, how, how do I become that person that next time? Great. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Roman Lazarev, uh, second semester of the part-time um, MBA program here. I got a question about the larger um, innovation and larger kind of scope. Do you, a couple of things here. Do you believe that innovation is the essence of the evolution, the human evolution, the product evolution, the company evolution? That's one thing. And uh, the second one is, do you believe that at the core of the innovation should be benefiting the people and then monetization of that um, benefit will come um, by itself? I mean, it will come as a complement, but first you you benefit the people by developing your best bulb, by developing your most efficient turbines. Start with that as the core value. Yeah, without, it, without question, it's like saying profit is my objective. Well, profit isn't your objective. It's a byproduct of what you do. It's a product of your efforts. So you can't have profit as the objective. You've got to have designing something new, putting it in somebody's hands, m making it a ha, maybe making people... Take Steve Jobs. Take the fantastic job he did with the iPod. 
I'm sure he didn't do a calculation as to how much money the iPod was going to make. He, he had a feel for what that was going to do to people's enjoyment and use of that. And then from that emerges a whole new Apple. So I think that's how these things come. And I do believe that innovation, again, we're not talking about that lab invention. In innovation is at the heart of a great company. It's in the blood. It's in the spirit of a great company. It's happening every day. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your time. I, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jack. Thank you.